what's happening this week on Art Rocks. An artist enchanted by his Louisiana surroundings as only a non-native can see them. Half of it is my story, the other half is the story that they bring to it and I think that connection is really what I'm seeking. Plus, the Louisiana State Exhibit Museum in Shreveport visualizes our Native American history. That's all next on Art Rocks. Support for this program is provided by Georgia Pacific Port Hudson Operations. Like the impulse that drives an artist's creativity, Georgia Pacific's 850 Louisiana employees are driven to produce quality paper products for your home and business. With additional support from the Renaissance Baton Rouge Hotel, centrally located for business and pleasure travel, the Renaissance offers intrigue style and southern hospitality. And by the Watermark Baton Rouge. Art, history, and commerce come together in the heart of downtown Baton Rouge at the Watermark, located in the historic Louisiana Trust and Savings Bank Building. And by Prescient's Point Capital Management, a fact-based private investment manager using forensic investigation to benefit clients. Research with impact. And by Ann Conley Fine Art, with the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and viewers like you. Hello art lover and welcome to Art Rocks with me, James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads Magazine. We begin today in the rolling hills of North Louisiana, Ruston to be precise. There you will find Nick Bustamante teaching art classes by day at Louisiana Tech and by night creating masterpieces about his adopted home that have stories to tell. His paintings are in high demand with collectors all over the United States. Nick tells us how he creates them. The collectors that I get most excited about dive into it. The story is part of the work and they really want to connect to it. Half of it is my story, the other half is the story that they bring to it and I think that connection is really what I'm seeking. And I always start with a series of sketches and I'll do color studies. Um, I always allow room for the work to grow though through the process so a lot of times I'll have an idea or a set of symbols that I want to work with but the story really develops and unfolds while I'm painting it so it's somewhat of a meditative process. Things shift and change. I'm okay with that. If I do a sketch and I know that's exactly what it's going to look like, then I don't know if I even want to make it because there's not that discovery and that's part of the process for me. I use the patterns. They refer to an internal or a psychological space. I'm really interested in the way that we experience things. They relate to, to memory. I really want the viewer to think about these in a more of an abstract or surreal dreamlike um, way, so that way they can bring their experiences to the pieces as well. There's a lot of precision. Uh, my, my paintings are very labor intensive, and that's just part of the process that I really enjoy. There's also a lot of layering through glazing and building up the surface, so it all goes back to experience and memory. So the paintings themselves embody that. The depth of field, it really is created through those multiple layers and slowly building up the painting. These are oil paintings, so it's a, it's a pretty slow process. The layering creates the darkness or the contrast, but also a lot of the color that you're seeing in the painting is actually optically mixed, meaning that I start with a really bright under painting, sometimes bright lime green or fluorescent orange, and then I slowly build up those colors. So color actually in the painting may appear to be a muddy green or a brown or a gray, but on closer inspection, it's really a bunch of subtle layers on top of this really bright layer that's making it appear to have that. That's how I'm getting the luminosity in the work, is those slow building of layers and letting the light pass through those multiple layers, coming back to the eye that allows for that richness with the medium. Birds are starting to appear in my work, and this is fairly recent in the last three years and they are placeholders for people, so they're, they act as characters. And the reason I'm interested in crows, they have a lot of similarities with, with us. Um, so they mate for life, they have families. They're also attracted to, to shiny things, which 
sometimes we as humans are attracted to shiny things and maybe it can be misleading. So the piece is, is talking about that and, and really reevaluating the family structure. Finding home is really about me putting roots in Louisiana. Chandeliers are hanging from the sky, which looks like a bayou scene. Um, I put the chandeliers in the sky as a way to show the elegance in the South. And then also this idea that this place, um, coming here, growing up in California and not being a Louisiana native, um, there's an incredible sense of mystery to me about this place. I, I, I a little bit romanticize the location in that in Los Angeles, you know, you have an acre of woods. It would be a park, right? The painting itself has my house in it. The most important part of the piece is the light on in the house because I wanted it to be about idea of home. And so for me, it's more than a house. It's after a long day of work coming home and the lights on and you know that somebody that you love is waiting for you, that is home. It's at night and there's chairs that are set up with fireflies. The first time I saw a firefly, a real firefly, was when I moved to Louisiana. I always thought they were just something that exists in cartoons. I didn't realize they actually were uh, as vibrant as they are. I also have a painting where an island is featured and it's all about this idea of home is what you create, right? So there are sheet forts that are being created on this island um, that's secluded. Uh, there is a paper telephone that was running through the water that is my way of talking about trying to communicate with the past which i think that's a very human thing is trying to connect to the past and now having a son of my own it's something that i'm really like i'm reliving kind of my childhood through his eyes in the painting greenhouse the landscape is the mojave desert and it's an old Air Force base that was abandoned, um, but also the shapes of those hangars resembled greenhouses to me, or I thought about greenhouses. And within the piece, I started thinking about if they were greenhouses, what they would function as and they no longer function. Now this is again me kind of making up the story of, of the space. So it's more of my interpretation of the space than what the actual space functioned as. In the sky, I've done a floral pattern that for me would reference what these structures could have been used for. It, it was carved into with cold wax, so there's actually a physicality to the piece. There is a, a lifeboat that is in the, the middle of this, the Mojave Desert. There are life preservers that are being thrown and cast out to the greenhouse structures. So it's this idea of trying to recover or save um, something that is, is beyond, you know, so it's like, holding on, to, desperately holding on to the past and trying to reconnect. I have a range of, of sizes um, that I work with, everywhere from 10 by 10 inches to six by six feet in paintings. Um, and then I've also worked on murals as large as 200 feet long by 17 feet tall. I really let the narrative drive what scale the work is gonna be. Sometimes it makes more sense for the work to be smaller and intimate. Um, other times it needs to be um, more grand and really immersive. It's not so much about being unique in a, in a bubble, like I don't think we li live in a bubble, but it's like how do you put your voice into these things that have influenced who you are? And, and, what, and more importantly, what do you want to say with that? What do you, you know, how are you adding to the conversation that has already begun? To learn more about these and other events in Louisiana, pick up a copy of Country Roads magazine. Another resource, the Art Rocks website features every episode of the program, so just log on to lpb.org and follow the prompts. Folks in Florida are also pretty good at keeping things interesting. 
Among them is this troupe of Filipino Americans in Tampa Bay who stage Dancers of the Philippines. They say it is a chance to connect with their heritage through music and dancing. Take a look at this rehearsal. Philippine dances is considered by the international audience as the most entertaining Asian dances because it's so full of variety. From Islam to tribal dances to Spanish flamenco and to the bamboo dance. With all those uh, combined occupiers, we call them, in the Philippines, we got all the, the different variety of dances. There's almost too much I've learned from not only being in the dance group and talking to some of the older members who've also lived in the Philippines, but also the dances. into history or culture, but I am now deep into the culture and tradition of the Philippines. I got involved in the dance company because I really wanted to learn more about the Filipino culture. They get to find out who their parents are, their roots, and when they go to their friends, they have an identity. When I'm performing the dances, it makes me feel more myself because I know that not a lot of my friends are really involved in their culture and their background, so being in this company really helps me explore that. And most of them are born here in the U.S., and it's such a great pleasure to be approached and say, I'd like to know about our Philippine dances because in college, I don't know my identity. When I formed the Philippine Performing Arts Dance Company, there were already a group of people here who were dancing. And uh, what we did is we announced to everyone that we were auditioning. So that created a lot of interest because they said, oh, we have somebody teaching for free, uh, a professional uh, former Philippine folkloric dancer. And I'm the oldest now. Yep, the oldest. <laughs> I was surprised he would still cast me. Usually he would get the young ones, you know, and just let the old ones uh, help in the cult, in the costumes or props. And no, he, he would still cast me in the dances. I would say, thank you, Joey. But then you tell me now if I don't belong anymore, you know, the age is showing already. Kick me out of there. <laughs> Joy's mentor, I, I consider him like family because of how long I've known him. Three, four, five, Joey has been quite an inspiration. It's, it's great getting to know him and knowing that he puts so much work and effort into having us be successful. He can do any part in any dance and he just knows them. He can do my dance, he can do um, the female part better than pretty much all the girls in the group, but he can really not only teaches us the moves to the dance, the history of dance, but also how we're supposed to feel during the dance. So we're, I think we're very lucky to have him as our teacher. What's that one? April all the way, huh? That's it. Food. I've learned from him to always do everything full out because you can only do it once and if you practice it wrong that's how you're going to perform it. The self-confidence between the girls and the guys when they go back to their classmates, totally different. The parents notice it too. I've helped um, kind of 
make myself more well-rounded in being a Filipino. And of course, the most important thing that I always tell them is that be responsible in, in what you're doing and enjoy what you're having right now because out there, there's so many Filipino Americans or teenagers who are not in your position having this luxury of being a member of the dance company. So I say, when you look back 30, 40 years from now, you have children and you will think, what have you learned when you were with the dance company? Self-confidence responsibility, respect. I mean, what more can I ask? With each click of her camera, photographer Connie Frisbee Hood captures stunning images across the world. Based in Albany, New York, this photojournalist hit upon her method of storytelling during a trip to the Middle East. When I first went to Afghanistan in 2003, and I got back, I realized I had very few photographs of the women. Because to me, I was not seeing, I didn't see a face, I just saw this blob, this ghost, this, you know. So the second time I went, I wanted to be much more conscious of photographing the women as they saw themselves, which is dressed in the burqa. I don't try and hide that I'm a photographer, because uh, I, I just think that's not fair to the people that you're trying to take pictures of. But I also don't want to do the, the posed, crummy smile, that kind of thing. I want to capture people as they're doing something. These women were feeding the pigeons and it just seemed like a contrast to me of these women covered and the pigeons are so free. So it was just a, a contrast. I'm looking at the light. I'm looking at the people. What is it that strikes me as interesting? But I also try to say, what's the everyday? thing as well because I don't want to just photograph the odd things I want to photograph the everyday things street market uh, this is in Herat often women feel like they need to have a male family member walking with them so this could be a son that's traveling with these two women this is my green-eyed girl and she's in a internally displaced camp this is a family that probably came back to Kabul. They might have wanted to go to their own land, but they don't own land in the same way that we own land with a deed. And so anybody else could be on their land and then they're stuck with no place to go. I think that, you know, if somebody were to take my cameras away from me, I don't think that would stop me from traveling and learning and gaining that part of it. I think what I would miss would be the opportunity to share it with others. I'm not a writer like some people could describe it in words and, and that is not, that's just not my way. So the camera is my extension of being able to share that. You can read things in the newspaper, you can read books, you can read, you know, listen to people talk about it. And it's just, it's not the same as really walking the streets and really meeting the people. After Hurricane Katrina, I went down with our church and worked in Mississippi and New Orleans. It just hit me in the gut when I saw the Ninth Ward, that this was like a war-torn area. It was just like Afghanistan. So then I started to put photos together. You know, each one has its own sort of sister image. You know, this part of this metal, whatever it is here with the destroyed houses behind and this kid's toy just out on the street. You know, the typical thing that you saw in Afghanistan were the pockmarked walls. 
of all of the gunshots, you know, whatever caused those pock marks. And then here you have the dried mud and probably whatever animal that is that remained. These were three of the people that were down when we were in New Orleans doing work. And this was our R&R fun afterwards and New Orleans' masquerade, the whole idea. And it just seemed to fit to me with the whole idea of the women in the burqas and that we play around with masks in a, in a different way. But I, it just, people to people is what it's about to me is seeing these, the relationship, the contrast, the similarities. In the end, we're just all people. We're all the same. Back to the Bayou State now for our Louisiana Treasures segment. The Louisiana State Exhibit Museum in Shreveport offers all sorts of fascinating dioramas that depict life in these lands across the centuries. So we asked curator Nita Cole to introduce some of the museum's most fascinating exhibits some of which are not actually dioramas at all. At the State Exhibit Museum in Shreveport, we have a wonderful collection of Louisiana's anthropology and archeological artifacts and history. And this goes back to the very beginning when the museum opened in 1939. We were very fortunate to have um, a trustee named Dr. Clarence Webb who was part of the forefront of the beginning of archaeology in the state of Louisiana. So prior to 1935 there was no archaeology program other than national, international scholars coming in. So Dr. Webb was part of being able to establish a program of scientific study. So we are very fortunate that we have the artifacts from his collection that concentrate on numerous tribes within the state of Louisiana, one of which is the Caddo Nation. And Dr. Webb started in the 1930s doing surface collections in the state of Louisiana, and he ended his career in the 1980s with the discovery of a Caddo dugout that was made out of one piece of cypress. So the highlight of the collection in the Shreveport Exhibit Museum is a 30-foot, 8-inch dugout made out of one cypress tree. It's called a dugout because of the construction technique. They would down a tree and then kill the inside of the tree by setting fires along one side of it. And as the fires smoldered, they would take stone tools and literally dig it out. And that was how the construction was accomplished. The dugouts were used to transport not just people but goods because they had an extensive trade network. And so it was very important to the economy of the Caddo Nation. It was located 20 miles north of Shreveport in Red River, buried in a riverbank that was approximately 30 feet tall. And so it had to be literally excavated or dug out. The dugout had to be dug out of the riverbank. And at the time of its discovery in 1983, it was the biggest, longest, Native American vessel yet discovered. Since that time, others have been located, one of which last summer showed up on a sand bore approximately in the same location as this one, and it's 34 feet long. However, it is not as old as the one here. Uh, the dugout within this museum carbon dates to 1035 AD. The new one that was discovered is 1370 AD. So this one's a little bit older, but interestingly enough, a, exactly the same technique of being a dugout where they would smolder the tree and then dig it out with stone tools. Our dugout is a cypress tree, so it would have been one of the old cypresses. We also have a, a slice of a cypress tree in another part of the museum that's approximately the same age. I think it's 980 tree rings on it. 
So there were virgin cypresses here in northwest Louisiana. Most people think of the Mississippi River as being where the cypress trees grow, but they're here along the river basins along Red River. Adjacent to the gallery of the Caddo Nation is a gallery of Poverty Point, and it is anchored by a diorama that was constructed on the direction of Dr. Clarence Webb. He and the archaeologist Dr. James Ford, who was the first archaeologist in Louisiana in 1935, worked for 20 to 30 years to excavate and research and produce the first official site report on Poverty Point in 1958. The diorama is based on their research and it shows activities within the site which dates to 1550 BC. So it's a 3,500 year old culture and at the time of its existence would probably have been considered one of the largest cities in America. It was trade-based they negotiated with peoples living in what is now Georgia, Alabama, the Southeast, up and down the Mississippi River Basin, and their specialty was making jewelry. They imported rock because it was difficult to obtain rock in the state of Louisiana because of all the, the rivers and the mud. So they imported rock and they made spear points and uh, other stone tools. Another of the wonderful things to see at the State Exhibit Museum is a collection we call Autographing History. And it's 54 original autographs from America's founding fathers, starting with George Washington. We have a full page letter that is signed by George Washington and going all the way through Abraham Lincoln and U.S. Grant. So we have them listed kind of in groups where you can go through and kind of pick out your favorites. We have a John Hancock, which is a wonderfully clear autographed. We also have uh, a Benjamin Franklin. And along with that, we have grouped a very nice Louisiana exhibit on the Battle of New Orleans. So we've got Andrew Jackson and we've got W.C.C. Claiborne's autograph, uh, who was the first governor, territorial governor, and then the first elected governor of the state of Louisiana. So there are several cases with artifacts in it. And then there's also a mural painting that depicts the battle that is part of that exhibit. We have probably 60,000, over 60,000 visitors per year. That includes uh, student groups as well as numerous out-of-state visitors. And that is that for this edition of Art Rocks. But don't despair, you can always find episodes of the show at lpb.org slash artrocks. And if you want more, Country Roads magazine is the ideal companion for making the most of Louisiana's vibrant arts and culture, close to home and all around the state. So until next week, I'm James Fox Smith, and thank you for watching.